And uh, for us here to speak as well, for you to listen and receive, but we are receiving every, everything that the Lord is giving to us by way of worship and uh, teaching and ministry. Um, before I forget, I wrote something. All right, for the FMCC pastors, as you know, we time our fellowship uh, the day after the seminar. So tomorrow we are going to have our um, fellowship at 10 a.m. starts with a brunch. It's going to be held at uh, 8 ZCC, Hills of Zion uh, City Church. And so every pastor here is invited, even if you're not part of the FMCC. But please, before you come, you tell me, or, or Sister Cora, or Pastor, or Sister Ate Nanet, Sister Nanet. Yeah, so, uh, so they can count the number of coming for the food. All right, secondly, uh, and I, I would love to do this, I, I like to do this. We would just want to recognize all the brethren from Vietnam. Vietnam, please. Okay. Praise the Lord. Thank you very much. Um. Oh, okay. Uh, and tomorrow, by the way, thank you. Tomorrow, Pastor Joe is speaking, by the way, tomorrow. So for, uh, forgive me uh, for not saying that. To Brother Joe will be ministering to us at uh, AZZZ. And the three Indonesian sisters we have here, uh, to Indonesian and the brother, two Indonesian sisters and the brother. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, uh, why do I why do these things? Because back in 2003, when it was SARS time, yes, yeah, SARS time, you know, we were invited to to attend a conference in Singapore, and uh, I mean the delegates hardly showed up. But our brethren from Singapore were just so delighted because, you know, the Philippine delegation came. So, I mean, we appreciate their coming. As well, we have our brothers and sisters. Sister Linda, come and introduce them. I, uh, I mean, you. All right. And um, we, we, we welcome our brethren from the United States. United States? You're from the United States? You stand? Okay. Welcome. And... And then we've actually got some Canadians. We welcome you. Welcome here. A Canadian. God bless you. God bless you. Okay. The rest are Filipinos, so you are all welcome. Yeah, okay, come on. This is the most important because it's more fun in the Philippines. We welcome all of the Filipinos. <laughs> She made us cry, she made us laugh, but she brought the message home to our hearts. Amen? Praise God. So Brother Norman asked me to share on uh, the rest of Christ, and so I picked up, you know, the very uh, familiar and prominent uh, scripture that has been being used. I hope, uh, because this is the word of God, it doesn't lose its anointing by, by me, you know. Matthew 28, uh, Matthew 11, 28. So... This message is entitled, Christ's Yoke of Rest. Matthew 11 and 28. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavily laden, heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Just as the verse that, or the chapter, the book rather, that sister, uh, our sister, dear sister Seth used, this is one of the most beloved verses in scriptures, goes with uh, Psalm 23, you know, and, and so it, it's simple and it's striking and it's refreshing because Jesus says to us, come, you know, so simple, an invitation. But it's a striking invitation and a very refreshing one. So he offers himself universally to everyone. Somebody said this. There's a quote. I tried to look it back again, you know. I feel indebted to the one who said this. But I couldn't find it. 
So, I mean, whoever he is, thank, thank God for him. But this is one scripture he says, alone could answer all the problems in the world. It would solve the failures in the life of every person who turns back from following God. And it will bring victory in a person's life. And I pondered upon that and I said, yeah, it's true. It's true. You know, you come to Jesus, accept his invitation, take his yoke, and yes, it will take care of all your problems. And this simple verse carries, carries with it, you know, sufficient power to live whatever weighs us down. Whatever weighs us down. I don't know about you, but uh, sometimes, or may, may I say many, many times in the past, when I'm down with sickness like hypertension, you know, I will wake up in the middle of the night and I knew I, I would be having a, you know, a, a hypertensive attack. You know, I, I'll, I'll reach for our digital, what do you call that? BP apparatus to find that I'll be up at seven, 170 or 150 like that. The first thing I do is I talk to myself and say, okay, be cool. <laughs> Which for the medicine, whatever available, I use the natural bawang medicine of Sister Linda. And so I do that. And then, you know, many, many times I would quote scriptures, you know, from memory. I'll try to quote, you know. It, it has a psychological effect. You forget what's happening to your body. And I think it also has a medicinal effect. The word of God. The word of God. And so, you know, when Jesus says to us, come to me. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. He is inviting us to enter into a kind of relationship and condition in our spiritual walk with him. And so, when, when I approach this topic to share with you today, I thought I'd like to, to know a little bit of the background. And so, you know, I, I looked up at the context, and, uh, and I found out, you know, what the context was. Why was he saying this? You know, you know in the Messiah law, there were around 600, over 600, you know, commandments. Uh, back in Singapore, somebody told us in a conference there were 612. In this research of mine, it says 613, but at least it's over 600. And on top of this, laws codified, you know, would be the additional rules and regulations given by the Pharisees. Okay, so the Pharisees were the religious professionals of the day. Back then, I think also you can include the Sadducees. The scribes. But the ironic thing is this. The Pharisees themselves could not follow the law. Yet, they forced the average Jew to follow it. So, when this ordinary Jew could not meet the criteria, they really came down on them hard. They make life miserable, miserable for them. So this is one of the many reasons why Jesus call them hypocrites, one of the many reasons. An example of this would be like, a Jewish family would be traveling from, you know, from a distance, a day, you know, or maybe days of travel, come to uh, the temple for the Passover meeting or Passover feast, only to find out that the animals they carried was unacceptable. And they say, well, your animal is not ac uh, acceptable, but we have available animals here at a costly price. <laughs> so there was also the corrupt system. And we know from our study that two times Jesus had to flip over tables and at the same time make a, 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 a whip out of cords and drive everyone out in the temple. At the beginning of his ministry, as well as at the end, almost the end of his ministry. So what was this yoke that burdened them? The yoke that burdened them, Israel, and weighed them down was the legal adherence to the law, or legalism, made worse by additional rules and regulations made by the Pharisees. 
what does Paul say about the law? Paul said this, but we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. So there is a certain way that the law can be used. It was given by the Lord. What does Paul say that the law can do or can't do? In Romans 3.20 he said, No one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with Him without keeping the requirements of the law as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago from the NLT version. Now go into the background. I read the prior verses, preceding verses. In verses 20 to 24, Matthew 11, Jesus upgraded three cities, Chorazin, uh, Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. He upgraded them because he had done mighty works in these cities. They received, you know, a better half of the three and a half years of Jesus' ministry. And he said to them in verse 20, he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works have been done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works were done in you, had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. And then verse 23, You, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. And I ponder upon that, that, that phrase, exalted to heaven. Then I realized that Jesus made this his, his headquarters in Capernaum. It was the center of his ministry. Capernaum. It was exalted in the fact that Jesus made a base of his ministry there. And yet, the people there did not repent. But immediately after this invitation, in Matthew chapter 11, we are brought now to Matthew chapter 12, as if to highlight, you know, from, from who the source is of this kind of legalism, as if to highlight that, you know. We are brought to a series of events. The narrative tells us there were at least four events that happened here in a semi-unfavorable dealings with the Pharisees. It was said that for those who were under the Mosaic law, they were yoked to Moses, but for those who were under the authority of the Pharisees, they were yoked to the Pharisees. And you don't have to go there, but let me just, you know, mention this. In Matthew chapter 12, you know, the Pharisees questioned the disciples of Jesus because they were plucking grain, heads of grain. You know, it was a time of Sabbath. Your, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to the Sabbath. And then, of course, Jesus answered that. Later, Jesus healed a man same day with a withered hand in a synagogue. And what was the Pharisees' response to this? He, they plotted to kill him because he was healing a person on the Sabbath. And then later, he healed a blind and mute that was possessed by the devil. What was the Pharisees' response? Oh, this miracle comes from Beelzebub. And finally, they demanded, demanded a sign from Jesus, which, of course, Jesus did not relent to. So the people of the aforementioned cities and the Pharisees were all witnesses of the mighty acts of Jesus Christ, but their hardened hearts were closed to him. And for this reason, Jesus was airing his desire, and his heart felt compassion. When you read, you know, the woes, in the more than the woes, I believe that Jesus' heart was broken for these people. And it was still giving them the chance. Come unto me. All you who labor, all you who try to fulfill legalism and all these rituals, externalism, come to me. All you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. There you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, 
and my burden is light. They were holding on to their sins and to their man-made righteousness. Later on in Matthew 23, Jesus said of the Pharisees, they had claimed for themselves Moses' is sit. Matthew 23 says, verse 2, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' is sit. Therefore, whatever they tell you, observe that observe and do. But do not do according to their words, for they say and do not do. And so their oppressive and legalistic ways have laid a great burden to the people. In verse 4 it says, For they bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Pastor John made mention of, you know, how much exception do we give ourselves? You know, and, and I, I kind of like, you know, yeah. Sometimes because we are pastors, we are leaders, but we can do this, we can do that, but you know, the ordinary member can't do that. We feel privileged or whatever we call it. And so how much exceptions would that fall to what we may say hypocrisy or hypocritical act? So although the law is good, although the law was holy and righteous, their interpretation of the law brought a yoke of guilt and frustration. Instead of freedom, the 630 commandments that they codified brought oppression. You know, we can, only, we can only look at ourselves, we who are leading the flock. This, by the way, is called the yoke of really Josephine. The yoke of really Josephine. And really Josephine is not faith. It is compulsive, it is repetitive, not comfortable, and not joyful. It broke guilt and hopelessness. And this enslaved the people of God, which Jesus asked the people to discard and then come to him. The practice of our faith can turn into a religious system that brings burden of guilt, frustration, and dissatisfaction instead of freedom and peace in hope. And as a pastor, I know, as a pastor, uh, speaking to fellow pastors and leaders, sometimes we have rules, you know, house rules at church. And, you know, some, some of the rules are fine. You know, neat, sharp, you know, not, not arguable, not debatable. Some are kind of like, you know, we need to. And I said, Lord, give me an example of this. And I, I, the Lord brings me back, you know, to this is a touchy issue. And I hope you will understand me when I open this up to you. Of our members falling in love to unbelievers. Or unbelievers falling in love to our members. The abrupt reaction is, be you not unequally yoked with unbelievers. That is, you know, and that is my reaction too. Okay. And, you know, I, I, look, I look at our members, and I said, are they falling in love to unbelievers? Really, really falling in love. What can I do about this? So as a matter of personal policy, when I know that there is something going on like that, I change stock. What I did is, oh, I learned you have a friend. <laughs> you know, can I talk to your friend? <laughs> And of course, they did. Ah, Pastor. <laughs> you know, and uh, I remember this kind of young, young man. I said, You know, you're a friend to, our, uh, to, 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 to her. Do you know that her parents asked me to, to talk with you? And by this time, you know, we, he would be like nervous already. And I tried to share the gospel to a guy or the girl, you know. And somehow, somehow, I'm not always, always um, successful, but somehow I can get the gospel across to a person who's unbeliever and give him an opportunity. And if I see that he's unwilling to accept Jesus, that's the time. You know, I came in a little stronger than before to our member, and I say, would you consider forgetting the guy or the girl? 
because he is not the he or she is not the right person, you know. Instead of just oh, you know, I think only yoki. So sometimes we set rules like that, and and, and I think it's a, it's the word of God, but the way we do it is important as well. So Christ makes an appeal. His appeal now is not only to the Jews, but to us as well in this seminar. To sinners and to save people like us. And the call is to believe Him. Believe in Him. Maybe the context for us today is not as much as legalism, but, you know, the many burdens, as to the many burdens that we carry in ministry, <laughs> which, you know, I don't know if that is a mistake. You call ministry mystery? <laughs> Sometimes it is, okay? For those of us who've been pastoring for years, sometimes it is. So the call is still for us to believe, to believe God for the greater things. He appeals to all of us to come to Him. Whatever situation we find ourselves in, at home or in the ministry, or those of us who are in the mission field, God is calling us, come to me. Jesus is calling all to a life of intimate relationship with him. Jesus' invitation is to a relationship, not a system of religion. Well, the religious among us may say, do as we say, don't contradict us, don't ask questions, do as we say, obey the system. You know, and I speak sometimes when I hear Sabi ni Pastor Edwin. Pastor Edwin says, you know, when I hear that, Lord, you know, the ugly spirit of Phariseeism is still around sometimes. And the potential danger is for us, you know, to fall into it. So I speak to us brothers and sisters that us be mindful of the rules of the house that we come up with. First and foremost, Jesus' invitation is not to a program. You know, if I can say this, not even to our church. His invitation is beyond that. His invitation is to himself. We constantly talk about disciple making and discipleship. To whom are we discipling people to? Is it to ourselves, to our church, or to Jesus Christ himself? And I know you know the answer. And so therefore, let us become leaders who will fully lead the people of God to an intimate and personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Come, Jesus says. And we've been hearing this in many ways in this seminar. Are we coming to Christ? Are we coming to Christ? Are we coming to Christ? I don't know, but I am a crier, and so... I shed tears, you know, when I'm touched in the heart. And I've, I've shed tears in this seminar already, especially in the just concluded session. <laughs> laughing, you know, uh, you're laughing and, and, and crying at the same time. In verse 28, B, all who are weary and heavy laden. And who is not weary? Who is not heavily laden? I think all of us. So again, I say it's a universal invitation to everyone. Relationship with Christ is not just offered to a select few, a select nationality or class of people. It's to all of us. And this is an invitation aimed at the curious and the convinced. We're part of the convinced. To bring them to a deeper level of commitment and intimacy. And with that, I thought Jesus had many other people which are not of this fold. So I inserted John 10, 16. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also must, I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. The specific object of appeal, of course, is to the weary and the heavily laden. Let me read this part. Though aimed at those under the legalistic system, 
they really describe the condition of all that are either without Christ as their Savior or as believers who are not submitted to him in an intimate relationship. Weary is the effect. Heavy laden is the cause of weariness. Heavy laden. Let's take up the cause first. The word heavy laden is a picture of an ox or any animal on which a burden is placed. I hope this is not descriptive of you in your ministry <laughs> where you are so overloaded. It means to be oppressed by the legal system. So based on the background or context. Again, let me read Matthew 24. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. We have the Holy Spirit of God who will remind us, you know, and I live with a person with a small age who is my Holy Spirit as well. <laughs> and uh, we share the same bed, same room. And so she reminds me all the time, you know. And, uh, and I think, I hope she's making a good work out of me. <laughs> And so it's not hard to admit that because we're still in the flesh, we can fall, you know, into this kind of legalism and also laxness, laxness, slackness, or neglect, or maybe plain laziness on our part. And from this, Jesus is, you know, inviting us away to himself. Weary to labor to the point of exhaustion. This word describes our state as a result of our fruitless strivings, human strategies, failed human strategies that bring nowhere in an attempt to alleviate our sorry condition. There are continually strivings taking place. You know, how many of us pastors, when we attend a conference like this, especially here it's different because we know each other, but in other conferences, the first question that's asked is what? You know, the name. And then later on, the name of the church. And then the third one is, how many members? <laughs> I don't know why, but that is, you know, the sequence that follows. And I thought sometimes that, are we trying to validate the success of our ministry with others? You know, maybe that's just my mind. But our job or ministry can become a heavy yoke if we are not properly yoked with Jesus. It can become a heavy yoke. Three years ago, I was mumbling and I said, oh, my life is boring. My wife said, what did you say? <laughs> what did I say? <laughs> you said, your life is boring. I said that? Yes. No, I really said that? Yes, you said that. You know, and that struck fear in my heart. And I said, why is my life boring? So I take it up with the Lord. And the Lord lovingly told me, you are on the verge of a burnout. So I'm not trying to say I'm a very diligent pastor, or industrious pastor, but I was on the verge of a burnout. Wow. And I said, okay. Monday is Sabbath day. You don't do anything. You don't go to Bible study. Don't do and as if the Lord encouraged me, somebody gifted me with a coffee card. 5,000 worth of coffee in it. <laughs> yeah, this is true. And I texted my children and I said, the first one to respond to this text, I'm going to treat, you know, in that coffee shop. It's a, it's a popular coffee shop. Many of you would know if you have the card as well. And so, I hope, I, I hope I have improved. I hope I'm not that person who's using my Monday Sabbath as Pastor Norman, you know, uh, ably pointed to us how we need relaxation, how we need to relax, to unwind, you know. You know, when he showed that picture, that was me. <laughs> and I hope I was relaxing, but I was, but I was accompanying my daughter, you know, to get her passport. <laughs> So, I will give you rest, he says to us. Rest, literally, is the cessation 
of work movement in order to relax, refresh, and recover strength. That was our first session. But in this session of rest, yoke to the rest of Christ, this is not what's being talked about. This is not the kind of rest. This is, the, this is not the cessation of work. This is not, you know, the end of labor. But rather, rest here is not the absence of work, but simply doing things through the ways of Christ, the means of Christ, and as well as the enablement of Christ. And there's a whole lot difference, you know. When you go out there, you preach your heart out, and you know you don't have the anointing because you did pray. Because you did pray. How many of you have experienced that? I have experienced that. <laughs> you know, I tend to be like bookish, you know, I was just mouthing some kind of words, but no effect. But how many of us have come to the sacred place before we come behind the pulpit and then issue the message of God that day. And what a difference it makes. We become life-giving, water-irrigating, you know, people, irrigating people with the presence of God. So Christ is simply saying, one needs to enter into that kind of a relationship, whether we call it crucified with Christ, the deeper life, whatever we call it, and grow to a point of intimacy where our all human strivings would cease. I think we are in the process. I think, you know, he wants us to come into realization that he has done everything there is to be done. And all that we need to do is enter into the blessings of the finished work. Let me quote again what was quoted in Hebrews 4.11. Let us therefore be zealous and exert ourselves and strive diligently to enter the rest of God, to know and experience it for ourselves, that no one may fall or perish by the same kind of unbelief in its disobedience into which those in the wilderness fell. Resting in Christ involved having our priorities right. And what tops our list must be our daily meeting with God. You know, and many times we failed. Again, Pastor Joe made mention how we seek that, you know, almost on a daily basis we were meeting with Christ and then suddenly in a certain day, you know, you didn't do it. How many of you have felt guilty that you did not do it? How many of you are like me? I feel guilty. And I said, how many of you have thought like, Lord, I did not read three, bird, uh, three chapters today, but okay, tomorrow I'll read six, six chapters. <laughs> and, and to you, I would say, don't pay God back, you know? Don't pay. Just, just do it, you know? If for reason, by reason of your laziness, you did not wake up the previous day, repent. <laughs> but I tell you, there are, there are times, there are nights, we're dog tired, you know, dead tired because perhaps of ministry or if you are traveling, you are driving and you're traveling, you know, and I, I mean, many times I've said to the Lord, Lord, can, can I stay in bed one more hour, two more hours, you know, and the, the, the Lord does not smite us or spank us because we, we took like one or two more hours and slept. Is that a legalistic master? From Oswald Chambers, he said this, We tend to use prayer as a last resort, but God wants it to be our first line of defense. We pray when there's nothing else we can do, but God wants us to pray before we do anything at all. Amen to that. Amen to that. Before we do anything at all. Now, when, when, when we are so used to what we're doing, like, you know, preparing a, a message, and it happens to me, sometimes I forget to pray, to ask God's, you know, light, or the Holy Spirit's light on the Word, sometimes, because I've been doing this, you know, for many, many years, I know how to do this, we tend to be relying on our own strength, in the intellect, 
of men. And that is not good. So, again and again and again, we are reminded, read the Bible, <laughs> pray every day. You know. And what kind of disciples are we really raising up? Really raising up. Uh, we started our corporate memory verse in the church last year. Last year, yeah. Of course, we've been telling the people to memorize. But as a corporate group, every every Sunday, you know, we, uh, every, you know, for the weekdays, we ask them to memorize, and then come Sunday, we recite it all together, something like that. And then, so we've been memorizing like about 50 memory verses already for the year. Here comes our Christmas party. It was a disaster, you know. <laughs> Nobody can remember what they memorized. <laughs> and I said, well, like pastor, like members. <laughs> you know. One day I can memorize John chapter 1 to 14. You know, another day, what is John 1? <laughs> John chapter 1, 1 to 14. You know, one day I memorize Psalm 23. Another day, what, what's Psalm 23 all about, you know? like that. So I hope we can do better this year. I hope we can do better this year. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. What is a yoke? This is the yoke. A yoke is a bar or frame that is attached to the heads of necks of two work animals, such as oxen, sometimes horses, sometimes water buffaloes, so that they can pull a plow or a heavy load. So, yeah, there. And so, okay, where am I? Learn from me. Okay, excuse me. I think I, okay. So you, a yoke for an animal means work. It means work. It means that a load needed to be moved or earth needed to be cultivated. It was heavy and burdensome for such animals. At first glance, we thought that Jesus' solution is not really a solution because after all, a yoke is a yoke. You know, yoke to another yoke. And, but but the, th the thing is, he tells us, take my yoke upon you. We are to take that yoke. Take here means to take on oneself what has been lifted in order to carry it. It's an imperative. It's a command. Taking the yoke means a decision willingly done. A willing submission. He invites us. Just as he invites us to open the door. And many times we've preached on that. I've read that a lot of times. Talking to unbelievers in a public forum, you know, come to Christ, knocking on the door of your heart. But now we're better off, we know better, and we know that that is not for the unbelievers, <laughs> but for the believers. Imagine a day Jesus is outside your life, and that is the prayerless day. That is the busiest day. That is the prayerless day. That is the day when you didn't fellowship with Jesus. And yet you are laboring and laboring and laboring. And it amounts to nothing. So yoke to Jesus. Willingly submitted. Taking his yoke upon us is a recognition and acceptance of his call. To a life of deeper commitment. Intimacy. With him, not under him, with him, in order to get the job done until Christ is formed in us. Until Christ is formed in us. We're missing the point in disciple making if our goal in disciple making is to make a disciple that will make disciples only. We need, we need that part. Disciples that will make disciples. But we need to bring in disciples that will be conformed to Jesus Christ. 
because we can be misled, you know, talking of church growth principles and things like that. Now, we need disciples who are being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Paul travailed for that. Paul travailed for disciples that will be in conformity with Christ. So it's not just any yoke, but Jesus' yoke. And he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And to be yoked to Jesus, I like to say, permanently, every day, all day, yoke to him where we can listen and do what he says. All of this, of course, are, you know, easier said than done. But let me just say it to us and to myself as well. And learn from me. This describes the process of a journey towards spiritual maturity and conformity to Christ. Learn from me. I think the King James Version says, uh, learn of me. Whatever it is, we know the meaning. Learn in the Greek is manthano, which is the verb form of the word disciple. Manthetes, which simply means a learner. And therefore, a disciple is a learner. And the verb form is to learn. To learn by inquiry, use by use and practice, to acquire the habit, be accustomed to. And the key idea is that acquire a custom or a habit through practice. So how do you start Filipino churches, your services on time? You start on time. How do you start? Because how many times have we failed ourselves to say, okay, sharp, sharp, sharp. We're starting on time and we start late. So it's a stigma on the Filipino that, you know, we, we start late in our gatherings. Somebody said, and I say amen to that, don't reward the late comers. Reward the early birds. See, I told you, they're just beginning. See, next time again, you know. Next week again. Don't do that. So we practice by starting on time because we are yoked to Jesus. We are on time. Jesus is waiting for us. But let me give you some verses on this. First Timothy 5 and 4. If any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents. You know, someday I'm going to wear a tag. Don't please, please don't kiss my hands anymore. No. And I'm not saying that rudely, you know, because a lot of you do that, that respect. And, and, you know, in a way, I, I like it, but, you know, I'm embarrassed sometimes. So just say hi, Pastor Edwin. Hebrews 5a, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. Jesus learned. He practiced. He was, got accustomed to it. To Titus 3.14, and let people also learn to maintain good works. How do you become a good worker? Well, maintain good works. To meet urgent needs that they may not be unfruitful. Thank you very much for every one of you who contributed to the Ta'al victims recently. Bless you. The Lord is talking about more than knowledge. Learning is more than knowledge. More than information, somebody says. But it is transformation. A changed life through intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus wants us to cultivate an attitude of a learner. An attitude of a learner who is someone who takes in and seeks to apply the knowledge he is learning. So this is going to be a lifetime discipleship with Jesus. A lifetime discipleship with Jesus. In our churches, sometimes we tend to relegate discipleship for the early, uh, uh, early converts or new converts. You know, we go through a discipleship, that's it. They've gone through our work, we, we call it a work, worker's manual in our church, uh, and that's it. It's disciple, okay? But it is a lifetime discipleship when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. Deuteronomy 17 and 19, and this descriptive of this, 
It shall be with him, and he shall read it of kings, this is said. Read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes. I have yet to come up, you know, with a Bible study in our discipleship manual that says the fear of the Lord. Because oftentimes we don't teach the fear of the Lord to new believers, which, I mean, is very much needed. Ezra 7 and 10, Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord. How do you prepare your heart to seek the law of the Lord? How do you do that? I don't know. Maybe I'll, I'll just sit, and then I don't know how to pray. What do you do? You speak in tongues if you're a tongue speaker. By and by, the Lord will give you indicators or direction. But we need to prepare our heart to seek the Lord. That we do. You know, especially amongst us here, every January we have our times of fasting, you know, maybe a series of weeks, or maybe just a week, you know, or it might, may even be a day. We prepare our heart to seek the Lord. James 1.22 says, Be doers of the word, not hearers only. Luke 6.47 says, Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings, and thus them, I will show you whom he is like. It's like a man building a house that dug deep on a rock. So, at least for now, God is using us. Although we're not yet into that deep intimacy with Him, yet God, you know, has given us the privilege. Okay, come on, work with me now. Yet, He's still calling us. Matthew 5 and 19. And I think the essence of this is the walking the talk. Walking the talk. Preaching what you, uh, uh, practicing what you're preaching. Matthew 5, 19 says, Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And here there's no room for hypocrisy. There's no room for, you know, a masquerade. There, there's no room for that. You know, you've got, you've got to be who you are, what you are. You know, what they see on the outside must be also in the inside of you. So what does it mean to pay Christ's yoke? Submit to him as the one who is gentle and caring. As the one who is gentle and caring. How many of us come to a Bible study and we are prepared to finish the material? I've done that many times also. Come to a Bible study, a cell group. I have my lesson plan or lesson, and then my objective is get to that period of my message. And sometimes we forget that these are people who have needs, and we ought to minister to them. God uses the word, by the way, yeah, to do that. Hopefully, we can have time to minister to their needs. Willingly put ourselves under his leading. Who is leading? Is Jesus leading? Am I leading? Learn to think and do like him. Learn to think and do like him. Learn to look at life the way he looks at it. How does God look at a certain member who, you know, comes, comes late every time, every week? They come late. They come late. How, how would Jesus look at them? How would they regard them? You know, we, a book that we read by my wife and I, you know, one of the books that Pastor Bailey gave us uh, consolation and, and inspiration because he said, you know, even if you're just, your members just come and sit, worship the Lord, just, just sit, you know, they are like into a roots of a tree that hold the ground. And that changed, you know, our perspective about people just come, sit, you know, and not involved in ministry. I think we need to, like Jesus, you know, let, let the love of Christ, let the love of Christ touch them. And who knows, one day they will be touched and they'll say, Pastor, what can I do for the ministry, for the church? When two oxen are yoked together, there is always the lead ox. And between us and the Lord, you know who it is. <laughs> Jesus is the lead ox. We don't lead him. He leads us. 
Otherwise, they will be working against each other. And sometimes, I don't know if Jesus feels that. Maybe he's grieved. Maybe he's grieved. But we are pulling, you know, and say, I'm going to do this, this way. And Jesus said, no, 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 this way. No, I've, been, I've done this before, and I'm going to do it this way. I was successful. And Jesus, all the while, saying to us, no, it has to be this way. Do you remember Joshua? Joshua of the Bible? No, Joshua of the Bible, he was given an instruction to go around the city of Jericho once in six days, on the seventh day, uh, seven times, 13 times in all, you know. And uh, he met with the captain of the Lord's house. But with AI, no encounter, nothing like that. He sent out spies, and the spies came, and came back, and they said, oh, it's just a little city, you know, don't, don't exert effort, don't, don't send all of the army, and uh, just send a few of us, and that will be fine. What happened was, 36 of them got killed, <laughs> they ran away from their enemies, and Joshua you know, lay flat on the floor, on the, on the ground, and the Lord said, get up! <laughs> What are you trying to, to do there? <laughs> you know? And, and, and God told him, there is a problem in the camp. You know? And later on, they were sent back by the Lord. But the Lord wanted all of the army. I mean, what works one time may not work the second time. What is the key? The key is hearing. The key is, have we consulted with God? Have we talked to our lead ox? What am I to do here, Lord? So this is a relationship of learning and following the Lord. Okay, I'm going to close. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls. You know, this, is, this maybe is one of them, the, the few places where Jesus tells us what this person is like. Can you think of any other verse? Jesus says, I am gentle and lowly. I am gentle and lowly in heart. The word gentle is translate, can be translated as meek. In the King James, it is. It is translated as meek. In the NIV, it's gentle, but the, but the lowly in heart is translated as humble. Now, they're just so synonymous. Sometimes it's quite you know, uh, difficult to understand these words because they're very synonymous, but they're different. Lowly means low in degree or low of low degree rather and gentleness is not being a wimp a coward a coward a weak person because the one who is leading us is consistent and insistent he has a direction and he wants us to go with him in his direction and also the pacing he wants the pacing so the problem with many of us, I think, is pride. And pride works against meekness. You know, meekness. You know, just be gentle. Listen, you know. Why, why don't you, not really to put up, but why don't you give the person a chance? Give a person a chance. And I mean, I fell flat many times before my family. Really, really fell flat. Insisting on my way. No, this is the way. Walk in it. <laughs> Driving one time, <laughs> going to Gideon, Kazan. And so my wife said, oh, are you turning left? You're supposed to be turning right. And I said, no, I'm the driver. I know this. I've been in this way before. Only to find out later, I was coming back to Manila. What do you do when that happens to you? Okay, guys, I'm very sorry. I was wrong. <laughs> and all of them cheered. It's a story in the family no one is able to forget. At my expense, of course. But, you know, that, that is an eye-opener for me. Listen. Listen to people. Be gentle. All right. Listen to, to leaders. Pride demands to be the lead ox. To find rest, we need to turn from pride. Turn away and then allow 
with meekness to lead us. Brother Bailey often says in his books, meekness is not weakness, but strength under control. What is the use of a very strong ox if that ox is not broken? What is the use of a very strong stallion or horse if that horse is not broken? They have to be broken in order to put them to use. So meekness on the inside is the secret to finding rest. It is the secret. Humble yourself before the Almighty God. Humble yourself before your wife and your children. Humble yourself before you know, your leaders. You know, when they have suggestions. I, I promised myself I did not write it. Don't use your children as examples. <laughs> but I did not write it. Because by the blessing of God, I'm so privileged they are here today. All of my five children. Easy. <laughs> my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Easy is a verb. That which fills a need and is well-fitting. Light means not burdensome, not overbearing. How is Jesus' yoke easy? And how is it not burdensome that it is light? Well, for those Israelites, can you imagine 612 or 613 commandments of, of Moses, Jesus one day suddenly said, well, if you can obey two, you obey them all. What is the greatest commandment? He was asked, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. You know, and I always, you know, with, 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 with cheer in my heart, says, he was not asked the, the second one, but he did it, did it anyway. And the second is, <laughs> love your neighbor like you love yourself. If you can do this thing too, you've done all the 613. So, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. For us here, how is Jesus' yoke easy, and how is it light for us? Well, we've been talking about it. If in our day, we enter into the presence of Jesus. Last Sunday, or the other week, I, have to be, I, I had a transparent moment. And I, I told my congregation, he said, this is his, your pastor in the morning. Very spiritual. Very spiritual. You know, devotional, reading Bible. You know, but the time, you know, the, the, the day wears out. By noon time, you know, less spiritual, less spiritual. You know, and I have a tendency to, to, to read newspapers in the internet. That's my kind of like, you know, relaxation. But it's not sometimes good because you, you, you spend a lot of time there. And, and my little Holy Spirit would say, hello, <laughs> are you at the back of me? Hello, yes, 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 yes. I'm finishing, I'm finishing up, you know. So I tend to be unspiritual in the evening times. And so one day, you know, I have this verse, which I forgot by now, by, by, now, by the way. <laughs> That, that tells, the, the second part says, you know, but be zealous for the fear of the Lord all the day. And that spoke to me during my devotion. I forgot the reference. But be zealous for the fear of the Lord all the day. Nobody can teach you the fear of the Lord. Nobody can, can, can how do you fear the Lord? It's a conviction that comes from the Holy Spirit when you feel so dry and you feel so desperate for the mighty move of God in your life, then you cry out to God, cry your heart out to God, and say, Lord, I'm desperate. Lord, meet with me. I need an encounter. Maybe I told you years ago, nine years into the ministry, I was drying up. And I was, Lord, I said, I was shocked. Lord, What's happening to me? I'm only nine years in the ministry and I'm drying up. And so the solution for that is I fixed a time to meet with God. And I had you know, wonderful times with the Lord. And that was capped 
with a trip to Guatemala, which I didn't know Zion was also there. And Brother Norman told me, we have churches there. If you want to go there, you can minister. So it's like, you know, hitting two birds with one stone. So I went to Guatemala and I had an experience with the Lord there that I can never forget in my life. But what brought, that became like a capstone in that season of my life. But what brought me there was a desperation inside of me that says, Lord, I'm drying up. And I was fearful what's going to happen to me. I'm young, I'm drying up. I was, I, I was, I, I was burnt out. And the Lord brought me out of that, if I can say, pit. Sometimes we find ourselves in a mud rut. Nabalaho sa Tagalog. You know? And the most powerful engine is useless. Because, you know, the, 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 the tires just grinding like that. Not catching the soil. No, no traction. Even the most powerful use, uh, engine would be useless. Even if it is like, you know, the ones that you are uh, driving now. Because you are in the mud rat. And well, how do we get out of that? You know, you don't need to go anywhere. It's in here that says, Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. And Lord, please with, meet with me. And God can do that in our most desperate moments. And so, okay, righteous now, righteousness now is no longer established to following rules and regulations. Now Jesus established it through relationship, a relationship with him. I'm studying a discipleship book right now which is telling me that relationship is a methodology. I'm still trying to grab forward with that. Is it a methodology? Is relationship a methodology? Maybe it is so. Maybe as a, as a revelation that I still can't, you know, cut up with. But yeah, if we are to succeed in our Christian walk and work, we need to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that's intimate. And as we do that, we are being conformed to his image. And so I hope that we are being challenged, as we have been challenged by Brother Norman, not to lose what we gained from the seminar. Because how many months, how many weeks, how many days after we have the last seminar, and then trying to keep track of that, by the way, for myself. We had seminars here, and when Pastor Billy was still around, you know, that the presence of God will, will last a while, last a while. And I hope we will contend for that. Because the enemy's work is to steal that from us. Now we're flying high. <laughs> We're still in the seminar. We're flying high. All the worship, all the words that we're listening, inspiring us, igniting something within us. So now we're just so excited, you know, to work with the Lord once again. And I hope we'll, we'll just keep on meeting with Jesus, develop that intimacy. Let's close our eyes. When we lead you in prayer. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Lord, how dearly we need an encounter with you. Not just sometimes, but all the time. How dearly we need your word to become alive to us. Not just to be memorized, not just to be read, but to be applied and to be lived out. Lord, we come as leaders. We come as leaders before you. Lord, we want to submit ourselves to you. We want to take your yoke upon us and learn from you and learn and learn and follow and follow lord teach us your ways lord enable us to the work through us lord 
be our lead ox, be our leader, be our guide. Set our direction daily, Lord God. Help us not just to cope up, but to thrive, Lord. All throughout the day, all throughout the night, when we wake up in the morning, oh God, a fresh, fresh meeting with you again. On and on and on and on. Forgive us for our laziness, neglect, laxity. Forgive us, O oh Lord, of not minding you even. As you wake us up deep in the night, when you want us to fellowship with you, when you want us to say a word, when you want to say a word to us, when you want to reveal something to us, when you want, Lord, us to intercede for someone or for something, O oh Lord, for the sick, for the dying member, Lord, forgive us for not giving you time in our day. Much enough time for our day. We are constantly in a hurry. We, we miss, Lord, a lot of things. We miss the beauty of ministry. Instead of it being measurable, Lord, it is beautiful. It is fruitful. It is the abundant life that you're telling us, Lord. It is joyful. God, help us to see that we are really, really privileged first when we came to know you. Thank you for that. And now we're even more privileged because, Lord, you have delegated to us the teaching and the preaching and the counseling and the praying and the ministering, oh Lord God. Thank you. Thank you too for that. Lord, you have a yoke for each one of us. And I just pray, Lord, that as we by faith take that yoke, Lord, the weight of heaviness will be removed in the name of Jesus. The yoke of heaviness, Lord God. I don't know if it's a yoke of sin, it's a yoke of laziness, it's a yoke of overly being busy, whatever the yoke is right now. A yoke of need for finances, for projects, even for life, for personal needs, family needs. Whatever yoke is weighing us down, Lord. Just say the word. As the centurion said, just say the word. Just say the word. And it's gone, Lord. It's gone. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.